Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Anatol Levin, Director of the Eurasia Program here at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Uh, before I introduce our author today, just a, a couple of mentions. Uh, firstly, uh, any questions, please put them in the Q&A, which you will see at the bottom of your screen, and I will uh, pass them on to uh, our author. And secondly, um, next Tuesday, the 7th, at the same time, uh, I will be chairing a panel um, online on the course of the Ukraine war this year and possible futures. So I hope that you will be able to join us for that as well. Uh, so it's a great honor today uh, to introduce our speaker, Professor Gerard Libaridian, uh, former Deputy Foreign Minister of Armenia, um, head of the, uh, the Armenian Studies Programme at the University of Michigan, and one of the most eminent historians of Armenia and the Caucasus. Uh, and we are here to discuss his uh, most recent book, which is which I have in front of me, A Precarious Armenia, The Third Republic, The Karabakh Conflict, and Genocide Politics. Um, and of course, we, we are discussing this in a, in a particularly tragic context, uh, which is the recent elimination uh, of uh, the uh, entity of Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh and the flight of its entire Armenian population. And on that score, um, <laughs> I, I should say that I think that um, the Quincy Institute and perhaps me personally have a particular affinity for Dr. Liberidian um, because uh, we are all prophets, but uh, who have deeply regretted uh, to see our gloomy prophecies coming true. So I'd like to begin, Jared, by uh, asking, I suppose, an obvious question. Um, to what do you, or to what different factors do you attribute this latest catastrophe? And could it have been avoided by different policies on the part of different governments, but of course, particularly that of Yerevan? Well, um, beginning from the end, I think in terms of its uh, significance for Azerbaijan, at the end, uh, Garapal was reduced to, to an excuse for Russian military presence in that country. Uh, an important uh, dimension in Russia's efforts to preserve its umbrella over the South Caucasus. Now, that as first, uh, that perception, then Azerbaijan's determination to put an end to undue interference of other countries in what it considered its internal affairs, and third, the unrealistic expectations of uh, the Garapal leadership from Russia, Armenia, and the rest of the world, uh, that uh, these three factors, immediate factors, uh, basically sealed the fate of Garapah. And could this fate have been avoided? Um, uh, well, I mean, ob obviously by different party, uh, different policies on the part of Azerbaijan, that goes without saying. But in your view, a different approach by successive Armenian governments, and you you write, extensively about this in, in, in the book. Could this have led to a different outcome in your view? Uh, certainly. Um, the problem was uh, that Armenian political thinking is very inward looking. It has not been uh, usually translated into a strategic perception of not only of its interests, but also how these interests fit in the region and the interests of others. There has been uh, a, a dimension of uh, believing in illusions in uh, what I call the savior theory, that there is somewhere out there a country or a group of countries for which for some reason or another uh, will come to save Armenia, maybe because it's a Christian nation, but also um, there is the problem of uh, two views of Armenianism. One is uh, the state. Uh, that is, Armenia is a state, had been a state some uh, centuries ago, 
uh, and it could be a state uh, with the attributes uh, of a state and a government that is responsible for the welfare and security of its people and boundaries. And this requires a very different kind of thinking than what dominates uh, Armenian uh, political thinking. It is the concept of an ex a, a nation, part of which is on, on historic lands and part of which is a diaspora. So um, that it became very difficult for uh, Armenians, particularly in the diaspora, to recognize that a state functions and must function differently. And it is it has different responsibilities uh, than the diaspora. So uh, that has been a very long uh, lived uh, problem in Armenian political thought. So on, on that part, we, I think, uh, we now see uh, the impact, the impact of that kind of thinking on, uh, for some Armenians, thinking that the state of Armenia was just a stepping stone to recover what was greater Armenia. Um, and uh, secondly, we have um, the history of the genocide and uh, genocide recognition, the politics of genocide recognition. That is, if uh, the interpretation of the genocide is, is fundamental in, in this respect. If the genocide uh, of 1915 within the Ottoman Empire and the uh, end of Armenians in that part of historic Armenia, if the genocide is interpreted as a um, sign, a, an articulation of uh, genocidal Turkey and genocidal Turks, uh, then that becomes a strategic foundation for uh, for the state and for the nation. That is, if Turkey is genocidal by uh, essence, then it will uh, it will come at some point or another to uh, remove or kill whatever is left of Armenians in Armenia, and therefore Armenia must not focus so much on independence, but on reliance of, for a, of a protector, which in this case and for recently has been Russia. Uh, and therefore you cannot have peace. And then Azerbaijan becomes an extension of that. Uh, now, if on the other hand, genocide is explained as a historical political event, particular to that period, uh, then it becomes possible to think of having good, uh, having normalization of relations with uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan and locating Armenia within the region and not as an outpost of the West or of Christianity. And, and this issue has been debated. It has been politically used. Uh, it has been used by outside forces and domestic political forces or internal domestic forces to argue that genocide is always imminent and uh, limiting the options that Armenia had. In, in the first administration after independence of which I was part uh, from 1990 to 1997, uh, we, we broke through that and tried to normalize, uh, and, but still were unable to uh, to get a resolution. At the end, it became possible, but the, the forces that used um, genocide and uh, related uh, uh, policies to remove their Bedrosian from the government, from the presidency, and return to the idea of, uh, yes, normalization with Turkey, uh, but no concessions to uh, Azerbaijan with regard to the results of the first war uh, with Azerbaijan that ended in 1994. And what concessions in your view were possible and might have led to a compromise? Uh, you know, uh, the question was that the leadership of uh, Garapal and uh, 
uh, administration subsequent to the first president's, uh, beginning in 1998, continued to visualize the solution as independence for Karapakh from Azerbaijan. Now, um, the question was whether that was a feasible solution. And throughout the years, there was absolutely no sign that that would happen. There was no country in the world that supported it, not even Russia, not even the best friends that Armenia had, I Iran, France, Greece, whoever. And the Lisbon summit uh, uh, statement confirmed that. And everyone, you know, who made any statement never recognized independence for Garapal. Now, for different reasons, but that was obvious. Our solution. And the only possible solution was uh, to delay to a su subsequent uh, phase the question of the status, since it was obvious that there could be no agreement between um, Armenians and Azerbaijan as being um, as as to the status. Azerbaijan would never allow independence, and um, and the the only only solution would have been a high level of autonomy, maybe a little higher than what they had during the Soviet period as an autonomous uh, region within Azerbaijan. Uh, our solution was that kind of a, uh, a project, uh, but because the leadership in Garapal did not accept that. Uh, and subsequently, the administrations of Armenia also did not accept. Uh, then it became impossible to resolve. If they insisted on having a status, and that status was going to be independence, there was no solution. In 1997, September, the Minsk Group wrote a, a project which was a two-phased, step-by-step project. That is, first, you end the war. You return. Uh, there, there were seven districts outside of the autonomous region which the Armenians had occupied, Azerbaijani, uh, and, uh, and expelled approximately 700,000. Azeris, and that was a, a problem which differentiated the Garapakh problem from, let's say, Chechnya or Abkhazia, uh, where the autonomous republics or regions uh, stayed within their own boundaries by and large. In the Armenian case, for uh, security reasons at first, and then the, the rationale changed, uh, and some people said, well, at some point, the argument was, we will return in return for uh, recognition of independence by Baku. We will return those uh, districts. And then the logic changed further, saying, uh, why return? This is history. These are historically Armenian lands. So uh, that logic kind of brought everything to, uh, to a standstill. Now, Baku, of course, uh, did not function uh, like other states that had separatist movements. Um, the, the French waited for a Quebec referendum. Uh, the British uh, tried another way to, uh, through peace to get the Northern Ireland issue. The Spanish uh, dealt with the Basque uh, uh, by legal means and then by uh, imprisoning the leaders uh, for responsible. Baku's concept, though, was that the land was the most important thing, the land of Garapa, with or without Armenians. So earlier, uh, during the First World War, uh, the First War, uh, and subsequently, it was the population that was treated as terrorists. It was the population uh, that was punished 
this is during the early years of the of the conflict, uh, and uh, so this uh, made it impossible for Armenians to think of uh, autonomy under Azerbaijan. So there was domestic reasons why you go for independence, but also the actions of Baku that made it difficult. Nonetheless, uh, no matter what, I don't think uh, the leaders were able to think of any other solution but independence, even when uh, the 2020 war indicated that Armenia had no longer any uh, power, any means to protect them. Um, so uh, the solution would have been uh, either to manage the conflict and the war, do whatever you can to provide security, and then at the next stage to have uh, discussions on uh, status. But if status was going to be decided uh, at a given moment, it would have to be autonomy. And that was unacceptable. Hmm. You know, Armenians are, are, of course, bitterly disappointed with Russia's failure to, to save Karabakh. I mean, in your view, does is this chiefly a result of Russia's distraction and weakening by the war in Ukraine? Or does this mark some kind of fundamental shift in Russian regional policy? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It is obvious that um, Russia is treating uh, Pashinyan's administration differently than it did uh, other administrations in Armenia. Uh, but also um, uh, Russian policy has hardened and uh, Russia has usually relied on domestic Armenian political forces to push for its agenda. Now, these forces um, might believe sincerely that that is the best way to proceed. That is the patriotic way. But that meant that they had uh, to submit to Baku, uh, to uh, Moscow, that their dependence on Russia could increase, sovereignty decrease, and it didn't matter. But this new administration, uh, Pashinyan, with his uh, 2018, uh, what is called the Velvet Revolution, uh, Pashinyan uh, insisted that um, uh, Armenia must have its sovereignty uh, respected and um, not submit because the Russian uh, interest in the conflict, for example, was uh, to keep it going or to resolve it in a way that makes Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, kind of under the umbrella of the Russian big brother. Now, Pashinyan made his, uh, his mistakes uh, uh, early on. And uh, he now obviously is, uh, is a believer in the normalization with the two neighbors. Uh, he still has some hopes for uh, Western assistance. And Baku has hardened its position uh, because of uh, its strategic uh, reserves that are uh, necessary for the rest of the world. But Baku has also learned some lessons in the sense that in the recent, uh, in the 2020 war uh, and subsequent uh, military operations, uh, they did not target the people. Uh, they were careful and one has to give credit to them. And secondly, um, it, uh, Baku believes uh, that they've become now a regional superpower. And, and therefore, um, it's possible to think uh, that they too have matured and that they will not have war against Armenia as an option again, because Armenia is something different than Garapa, right? It's a sovereign neighborly state. Well, and uh, of course, with Armenia, 
Russia does have a, a defensive treaty, which obliges it to defend Armenian territory, which did not, however, cover Karabakh. Absolutely. And I, I think uh, there may be an explanation for that. Uh, that treaty was signed in 1997 when I was still working in the government there. And although the treaty does not say so, in Moscow's mind, that um, treaty and the military base was to be used uh, in case Turkey attacked. The framework of... of uh, uh, the strategic thinking at the time was that Armenia, Armenia's threat was Turkey and that uh, the military base and the treaty would, would uh, defend Armenia in case Turkey attacked. But it did not envision, I don't think, it, that the Russians did not envision that the, there would be an Azerbaijani uh, attack on the territory of Armenia. And that... Um, made a big difference. Also, and more importantly, that treaty does not include Garapa. That is, Garapa is not considered Armenian in as far as that treaty is concerned. It was the um, the state, 20, 29,800 kilometers square, uh, that was to be protected. Now, there's an other, therefore, when Garapal was hit, the Russians uh, did nothing. And that, first of all, hurt uh, the image of the Russians in Armenia, but certainly when subsequently Azerbaijan had inroads into Armenia proper, uh, they refused to do so. And partly, probably because they thought that might help the opposition in Armenia to topple Pashinyan. That is a very important. Uh, uh, dimension. So uh, the Russians uh, have tried a few things to topple Pashinyan through domestic forces, uh, but it has not worked. You know, there's this strange situation of uh, Pashinyan losing the 2020 war, let's say he was, although responsibility for that loss extends all the way to the uh, administrations on uh, since 1998. Uh, Pashinyan has responsibility, but there was huge propaganda to make him responsible for everything uh, that uh, uh, that happened that was bad. Uh, Pashinyan is the prime minister when the war is lost. Um, and then uh, the opposition is in the streets and they want a, to force a change in government. Well, Pashinyan says, okay, let's go and vote. And he goes, uh, some months after the loss of the war, he goes into a, um, an election, parliamentary election, and he wins. Mm -hmm. How could, how could that happen? Well, what happened was that the people of Armenia sense that the Garapa issue, the Garapa war was more or less, not that the war was lost, but the issue would not be the primary reason for which they would vote for this or that candidate. A very was, different situation from the 1990s. I was, I was struck by the difference right. of mood there. Right. Uh, they, the 20 years preceding Pashinyan, uh, the two administrations, each 10 years, Kocharyan and Serge Sarksyan, uh, people did not like the kind of uh, government that there was there. They did not like the uh, corruption becoming endemic. They did not like the authoritarianism. They did not like the abuse of power uh, and uh, the lack of any punishment for anything that was done by governments and their sons, right? So that uh, they did not want uh, a return to Kocharyan, and he had become uh, the main uh, opposition figure running for the premiership. So uh, people thought 
that um, now it was time to focus on Armenia, and Armenia could not be could not return to Kocharya. And subsequently, of course, when um, the Russians failed to protect Karapa, they failed to protect the Armenian border uh, with the lame excuse that uh, we don't know where the border is, uh, which is, as I said, lame, because if you didn't know, then why do you sign the treaty saying what borders were you going to protect, as well as the collective uh, treaty? It, if you didn't know, how do you accept right, uh, uh, that you will defend those borders if you don't know where they are. So uh, that, uh, the fact that the Russians refused to do it well, was supposed to kind of, on Russian accounts, uh, calculations, it was supposed to weaken Kocharya and give the opposition to throw him out. Well, elections didn't work, to throw him out through street action. You mean Pashinyan, I think. To throw out Pashinyan, yes. And that worked on the, the other way. That is what people saw, that uh, those who uh, wanted to keep the Russian umbrella and uh, submission, uh, that uh, that opposition was no longer acceptable. To most people, I now spend uh, many months in Armenia, and last time I was there, the last time I saw the demonstrations that did not go beyond 10, 15,000. And uh, uh, while Pashinyan had hundreds of thousands in the streets, when, uh, when they were demonstrating, let's say, on the square near the opera, uh, I would stand uh, at the red light uh, a few hundred meters away for half an hour and people waiting for the green light to cross the street. And I would listen to what people are talking, looking at the demonstrators. Uh, and they always talk. And the main statement coming, the dominant statement was, what do these people want from us? So, uh, that kind of makes them also vulnerable to uh, propaganda, that uh, to charges or strategic thinking that Azerbaijan is ready to attack and attack Armenia, whether Sunik in the south or the north. Uh, they become very vulnerable. Uh, and so far, uh, Azerbaijan has not, and it has stated that they have no intention to use force, uh, specifically even mentioning the uh, the transit route that was supposed to have been implemented in the south, connecting western Azerbaijan to Nakhichevan. Uh, they, they are uh, stating that they don't intend to do that, and they would negotiate for that rather than now, there have been also many statements from Aliyev and others previously, uh, until very recently, that really were boastful and threatening, um, talking about Yerevan being Western Azerbaijan uh, and things like that. But I, I personally think uh, there's, that's, these are expressions from Aliyev of uh, resentment and anger of the what they consider 25 years of humiliation until the 2020 war. That is, Aliyev is trying to teach Armenians, this is what you did to me. You claim Garapa was Armenian and uh, you occupied it and now I want you to understand what we went through. This is one element which we have to consider um, to try and ex to explain what he's doing. You know, if we interpret it as a real threat, then we have a serious problem. If we interpret it as, so in political thinking, strategic thinking, you have to consider all the possibilities until you come to the one or two that are more likely. 
And if you want to create fear and use fear as strategy, uh, then you are likely to give one interpretation. Um, but I think I think that's changing, and uh, right now it there are some statements from both Baku and Yerevan that uh, they they will get to something uh, as a peace treaty by the end of the year. That has happened before uh, that it will happen, but we will see. We will see what happens. But I think. Uh, I would take Azerbaijan's uh, statements that they do not have any plans, they do not intend to solve any problem by force. Uh, that, I, I guess, assuming negotiations go well. What, what would such a treaty involve? In, uh, I mean, what would its terms be? Well, uh, I think there are a number of issues pending. Some issues, uh, now there are, if, if it's a treaty, uh, then it would resolve all or most of these issues. But if it's just a peace agreement, it will resolve mainly the question of peace and maybe create mechanisms to resolve the other issues. But a peace agreement, uh, I would assume, would have general principles that we recognize each other's territory, in, integrity, security, uh, and uh, uh, rule out the use of force or threat of use of force, uh, elements like that, and general principles of uh, not necessarily all normalization, uh, but maybe the possibility of uh, saying, okay, we, we are where we are, and from Iran, we will use diplomacy to solve the problems. I do not know that after so much mistrust uh, between the parties, uh, it will be it would be possible today to solve all the problems. Well, I have a question uh, from the audience. Uh, was any consideration ever given to, to the idea uh, of a compromise involving the exchange? of a corridor for the Azeris across southern uh, Azerbaijan in return for some form of recognition of, of Karabakh? A recognition of Karabakh as independent? Independent, or well, uh, there was also the common state idea of full autonomy. Well, common state is, uh, you know, the idea of common state was uh, considered uh, under Kocharyan, that's nine, 1998 to 2008, it was considered, uh, but uh, it was not acceptable to Baku because uh, Baku thought of it as uh, if if this is a wedding that is agreement by Garapar and Baku to be together, then the the marriage could also be divorced, you know, ended. So Baku. Uh, did not like that. The other possibility was also under Kocharyan, uh, the kind of solution, and that was the exchange of Garapal. Uh, Garapal would go to Armenia, and Mehri, the southern part of Armenia, would go to Azerbaijan. And that, in my view, was a totally impossible solution, uh, primarily because no president of Armenia has the right to give away. Constitution does not allow to give uh, anything away, any territory. But also, secondly, Meri may be one of the most important, geopolitically important uh, uh, pieces of real estate in the world. Uh, and that would, uh, that means that Armenia has it to keep it, but Armenia does not have it to give away because there's Iran, there's Russia, there are various interests. So uh, it, it's not just any part of Armenia, it's an internationally strategic uh, point. And that uh, solution uh, was agreed upon between the two presidents, President Haydar Aliyev and, and President Robert Kocharyan, but it uh, was not possible to implement. Uh, when they agreed to it, they returned to their capitals, and uh, uh, there was no way it would be accepted.
by even within the governments themselves. I know that, for example, after Mr. Haydar Aliyev returned and talked to his advisors on it, three of them resigned within 48 hours. Mm. Yeah. And uh, and uh, Kocharian was told very clearly he couldn't do that. And it was a dangerous thing to do. Uh, first of all, because if you give away Mehri, Armenia becomes mainly a big village as far as the international uh, community is concerned. The connection to Iran is very important. Now, it does mean that there cannot be a solution to, for a transit route. Now, the November 9, 2020 ceasefire statement that ended that war, Article 9 uh, says the communications will be open and there would be uh, was not called a corridor, but something like a transit route, uh, first to connect Western Azerbaijan to Nakhchivan, and uh, uh, but um, under under Armenian sovereignty, but security provided by Russian border troops, and that was not a, a very pleasant thing for Armenia to sign, uh, and there for a while there were verbal battles regarding it and some words of threatening that it could be taken by force. But that has changed, first of all, because the November 9th statement cannot be considered valid anymore. Three countries signed it, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Russia. And that they provided for um, peacekeeping forces, uh, Russian forces in, in Garapal, in and around Garapal, and uh, the uh, and a ceasefire. But the ceasefire was broken by uh, Azerbaijan by using force to expel Armenians. The Russians failed to protect the Lachin Corridor, and Azerbaijan was able to implement an eight, nine month. Uh, uh, blockade of Garapa, and if the two of the three countries don't, uh, they violate the, the statement, then the third country has no reason to respect it. And I assume that, I mean, any kind of extraterritorial status for the corridor is completely unacceptable to it Yerevan. Is. It is, right. Yeah. It would have to be a transit route, and we're also talking about the railroad, which function mm -hmm. during the Soviet period, uh, which would have to be uh, remade, uh, modernized and all. Uh, the Azerbaijanis are doing on the other side. Uh, they're working on it. And now Azerbaijan is saying, uh, if Armenia does not agree, we will not take it by force, and we will do a, a detour through Iran. Now, whether that really means that they've given up uh, is not clear. Uh, that still going through Armenia would be best. So what needs to be done is a regime that facilitates. Uh, maybe a high-tech uh, system could be used to facilitate Azerbaijani's movement. Um, so it's, it's still possible. I think it's still being considered, but it's good to know there won't be uh, force used. At least that's what Baku says. Mm -hmm. And barring, I mean, I suppose not inconceivable, uh, almost alliance between Iran and Turkey, it would be very difficult to see Iran agreeing to, to such a corridor through its territory between Azerbaijan and... Well, it will not be extraterritorial. Oh, certainly not. No, that's yeah. the question. But, uh, but both countries, uh, uh, Iran and Azerbaijan, have declared it. They use Iran anyway. Hmm. You know, they've been using Iran detour uh, since the first war. Nakhchivan people to uh, Azerbaijan, eastern Azerbaijan. They've been using it. Last year they did an opening to a, uh, a, a better infrastructure and they've recently talked about it again. So um, it is you know, the the difference between today's, the way the international community functions now and uh, earlier is that 
any country that there are no two camps, there are no three camps to begin with, worldwide, superpowers, right? Uh, there's no such thing. Uh, you can have a thousand nuclear weapons, but these are not things you can use every day, right? Um, number or one. any day, hopefully. Right. It, uh, they perform some function, but their function is not to threaten or to use against uh, some people. And look at Turkey. A NATO member buys weapons from Russia, defies NATO policy in many ways, right? Uh, gets into Syria, Iraq, um, and uh, uh, threatens Greece and, you know, in the seas. Um, it's, uh, it's not clear uh, what meaning its membership has in NATO. Uh, you look at Iran and Turkey that are considered traditional enemies. On some things they cooperate, on some things they don't. I uh, Iran and Azerbaijan were thought to be at each other's throat a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And now they're talking north-south. They're talking uh, of, of, of the road connecting Nakhchivan. Uh, you know, uh, so it's the policies of uh, various countries are, are not uniform. They're not homogenized. Today, uh, uh, look, Israel and Turkey, right? Uh, they were enemies, and then they became friends, and then they became enemies again with two recent uh, events there. So uh, I do not think that one should calculate strategically based on the old notions of these two countries are enemies or these two countries are friends. Azerbaijan and Russia, look at the way they functioned. Uh, Azerbaijan... Uh, does a number of things against Russian interests. And then uh, also they are considered strategic partners. And day by day, according to the issue, they are friends or they're not friends. So in, in uh, I at least do not think in those terms. And none of the alliances I consider permanent and none of the enmities I consider permanent. Mm -hmm. And what are the, the, I mean, I think what the latest catastrophe has illustrated is, of course, Russia has proved a, a very unreliable partner of Armenia. But then, of course, the no Western country came, uh, in, intervened, despite much, um, much rhetoric. In, in this more fluid world, without fixed partners, um, would you see that as giving opportunities for Armenia, or in general, does this create a very dangerous world for Armenia? It it is both. It is both. That is, uh, if there are military threats against Armenia, then it's very dangerous. If Armenia can manage the threats to diminish or disappear, then it's an opportunity. Uh, in my view. Um, the best security Armenia has is to settle its issues with the neighbors. It's as simple as that. Now, that may require some things that are not pleasant, but that's the best way. You decrease the danger and you increase your security. That is extremely important. Armenia must think, and it has started thinking, in terms of uh, the region, the sub-region, South Caucasus. You mentioned, uh, I think, earlier about um, about uh, Armenians not knowing as Georgia and Georgia. And vice versa. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, beginning with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the three republics, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia, did not shift their strategic uh, thinking uh, did not change. That is, previously it was Moscow, right? Once Soviet Union broke up, uh, it was Washington, it was Brussels, it was still Moscow for some. You know, it was, they were looking outside for their security. 
mm. instead of looking at each other. And as long as you look outside, then you will be manipulated. Yeah. You, uh, the key is now, I think, is for the re for these uh, republics to start looking at each other to begin with, to develop a regional identity that will uh, make them less vulnerable to manipulation, make them stronger. So uh, any peace should also begin to think about the regional cooperation component, which all three republics now realize is essential uh, for their first well-being uh, and uh, for their security. There are so many areas they can start uh, cooperating on to begin with. I'm not saying there should, there could be at this point a security arrangement that really provides security, uh, but there could be arrangements that will increase trust, uh, get people to think about each other, uh, and and then eventually maybe build a, a regional understanding that is not against anyone. It is not, it would not be against Russia or Iran or against Turkey, but it would be something that solidifies the sense of belonging to a region uh, without losing any sovereignty. But cooperation on disaster relief, health issues, communications, uh, and uh, you may start looking at textbooks that are being used in schools. So it it is, uh, you know, if uh, Armenia is alone, it does not have friends. There are countries that love Armenia, but that's a very different thing than being an ally of Armenia, an ally that works. Mm. You know, I'm very impressed by, uh, by the very nice words that are said about Armenia and all the visits that are going, but they provide nothing. The West, Anato, in my view, is best when disaster has taken place and you go for relief. On that, Armenians can rely. There will be relief if there's a, a disaster, if there's a an earthquake or an attack or ethnic cleansing. Yes, there will be relief. But it has not produced anything of substance. You know, France may sell weapons and India may sell weapons, but these are business transactions. Armenia right, buys weapons from Russia. It may buy from China, but these are not alliances. Uh, and I do not see that in the foreseeable future, Armenia will be able to match Azerbaijan in, in that kind of... Hopefully there won't be an arms race. That's something that could be discussed when a little bit of trust is built uh, in in their contacts. In in a way, I suppose you've already answered this question, but there a question from the audience. Um, there have been, of course, a, a row of previously unrecognized states or, or territories, South Sudan, Eritrea, Kosovo, Timor, uh, which have in fact achieved uh, recognized independence. How is the case of Karabakh different from those? Well, there was international interest for some reason or another. Uh, there were serious pressures on Indonesia in the case of Timor. Uh, but uh, there was no inherent interest in Garapal, except, uh, you know, I Russia had its reasons to see the conflict going. And uh, let me tell you a story quickly. Uh, maybe some will remember Ambassador Jack Mareska, John Mareska, who was uh, uh, U.S. Ambassador to the CSCE, predecessor to OSCE, and later U.S. Ambassador to the MISCU. Very competent, very able uh, diplomat. And um, when I'd left my position in Armenia and did an oral history project with the people I'd negotiated with, and I have about 27 tapes 
oral history tapes about uh, their world, what they thought, how they made decisions, which someday I will, uh, I guess, publish or make available to people. And uh, one of the questions I ask everyone is, uh, why did you get involved in Garapal? No one had heard of Garapal, right? Armenians in the diaspora had rarely heard of Garapal. So uh, I would ask my interlocutor, why? Why did you get involved? And uh, I can say this. Jack uh, said, you know, uh, we, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, we ended up having geopolitical, geostrategic interests in that region. We have Russia, Iran, Turkey, Caspian, and Central Asia. But he said we had no legitimate reason to be there. Okay? Yeah. And uh, being involved in the Garapa conflict was gave us a foothold. Yeah. But not a foothold that they had any particular desire to use in a positive way? Well, uh, no. And, and the secondly, for the West, uh, that region is not uh, strategically vital. Uh, but for Russia, it is. Mm. For Iran, it is. So uh, regardless as to how Russia comes out, compared to these republics, Russia will still be relevant and very interested in the region. So whatever evolves should not be anti-Russian, has no reason to be anti-Russian, but it can be uh, uh, less vulnerable to the quirks in Soviet, uh, I mean, Russian diplomacy. I think everyone has noted that Russian diplomacy has become so harsh that, you know, uh, I always considered uh, Russian diplomats extremely capable and mm. fine-tuned uh, but that seems to have gone and, you know, uh, well, maybe it will come back. But uh, but uh, the republics there must realize that it, it can't, they can't be anti-Russian because, I mean, either for neo-imperialistic reasons or in, in, in Russia's case, I think the problem is that if that region is so-called lost to Russia, then the West borders reach Russia, and that those borders are all the Islamic autonomous republics. So the danger to those, so it's a question of the survival of the Russian Federation uh, that is at stake, while for the US and for France or Germany, such threats do not exist. Well, and from the perspective, of course, of the of the Caucasian states themselves, uh, it's difficult to ignore Russia or Iran or Turkey for the simple right. reason that they are there, like Mount Everest, right. uh, whereas Western states are a, a long way away. I, I remember in 1995, uh, I was a, the senior advisor to the president and secretary of the Security Council, by the way, for from 94 to 97. And... Uh, the United States Congress had passed ILSA, the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act, and a high-level delegation came to uh, Yerevan to ask that Yerevan respect those sanctions. And President Derbed Rosian listened carefully and said, okay, uh, we understand what you want, but uh, you have to understand one thing. Iran is a big country, and it's here. U.S. is a big country. You are now enemies, but big countries often change and they become friends. Now, you will forgive each other, but we will never be forgiven if we join your sanctions against Iran. Mm -hmm. So we cannot do it. <laughs> and... Um... Iran has, of course, been around in that part of the world for some 2,500 years, which is rather longer than America has. Of course, they, they have diplomacy uh, in their blood, you know, uh, and you have to work very hard to understand their style of doing diplomacy. They have 1,000 ways of saying yes 
only one of which is yes. <laughs> they have 1,000 ways to saying no, of which only one is no. Okay? So, um, and you have to understand in order to, you cannot understand it by Western terms. And it's very deep. They have had statehood for so long, as you mentioned, and a very proud history and a very proud nation. So uh, you, you cannot, and uh, Turkish diplomacy has its own style and uh, it's, uh, it's, it has excellent diplomats, but it's a very different style. Um, one more question, possibly two, perhaps I'll, I'll put them together. Uh, one question, you know, there are now more than 100,000 refugees from Nagorno-Karabakh in Armenia itself. Right. What impact do you think that they will have on Armenian politics and policy? And another question, to what extent was the uh, the, the the defeat in, in Karabakh the result of of, t of tactical errors on on the part uh, of the Armenian side. I mean, in Ukraine, we have seen the power of the defensive, uh, but that doesn't seem to have to have worked um, on this occasion uh, for Armenia. Well, with regard to the one hundred thousand, uh, uh, obviously there will be attempts to. Uh, use that force against Pashinyan. Um, and I can see those already happening. Uh, there will be, for many decades, Garapa leaders have taught their people uh, that Armenia owes everything. And if something happened to them, uh, such as during that particular, uh, the, the most September, uh, Azerbaijani military operation, Armenia didn't come to help. You know, there's these unreasonable expectations, unrealistic expectations, and that can turn into uh, against Pashinyan. Uh, but I think uh, there is reason to believe that a lot of the Garapalis also resent their own leaders. They don't trust them as much as before. Maybe they did not trust them as much, but it was Garapa was more of a militarized society, securitized society, uh, despite what uh, democracy they did practice. So I would think that it, it's it's not easy to for me to pro, uh, to project. Now, I do see and I do understand that maybe more than half will not stay in Armenia. That is, those that have relatives, those that, that have some money and others uh, may decide to stay. And they're, they're now dispersed all over. The South cannot accommodate uh, everyone. But uh, many of them will leave for Russia if they have relative abroad, France, US. Uh, I know that so many of the refugees or from the this, uh, refugees from the 1991 expulsions in Azerbaijan first came to Armenia, but a uh, few of them stayed. The United States took so many of them, and you know maybe it will do the same now. Uh, uh, there are underlying resentments between the two peoples that the government tries to kind of keep it so it does not exacerbate the problem. But, um, you know, the, there are issues between the two. And if you are a Garapali who speaks only the dialect of Garapal and not the literary army, it is difficult for you to live in Armenia. Mm -hmm. This is a very serious issue. Um, and they they may prefer to go to Russia. Now there's also talk of um, returning, which I think is not only useless but also dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just useless, yeah. uh, but different countries have different reasons why they want to talk about it, as if there's still a Garapal issue, unresolved issue, 
and there's a future for it. So those who have used Garapal in the past in their policies want to keep it there. And, <clears throat> and as I said, it is useless and, and dangerous. I fear so. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time, but Gerard, thank you so much for these fascinating insights um, into a very, alas, tragic story. But you at least did your best to, to prevent this catastrophe, on which I congratulate you with all my heart. So thank you. Thank you. I'm and, so saddened that I was right. You know, yeah. it doesn't give me pleasure, as I'm sure it doesn't give you pleasure. Uh, the question is not to feel right. The question is to do right. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Anato. And thank you to the Quincy Institute.